Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on asthma. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the use of bronchodilators uh, to treat asthma. Okay, now, uh, we're not going to talk about all of the bronchodilators, okay, so, um, specifically, we're not going to talk about beta-2 agonists, because we have a separate video in this playlist in which we specifically talk about beta-2 agonists. In addition, we're not going to talk about phosphodiesterase inhibitors, because, again, we have a specific video in this playlist for uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, first the anti-leukotrienes, we're also going to talk about antihistamines, and finally we're going to talk about muscarinic acetylcholine uh, receptor antagonists uh, in the treatment of asthma. Okay, so we're going to start off by discussing uh, the pathology of asthma, uh, and then we'll get to how these drugs work, how these anti-leukotrienes, how the antihistamines, and uh, the acetylcholine muscarinic receptor antagonists. Okay, uh, how they work to um, open up the airways when someone is having an asthmatic attack. Okay, so before we can start talking about the pathology of asthma, we need to firstly talk about the structure of a bronchus. Okay, so let's say we have a cross section of a bronchus, and let's have a look at the structure of it. So whenever you're drawing a bronchus, it's a good idea to start uh, by drawing a tube. Okay, so here is a cross section of the bronchus. Right, so let's draw the epithelium of this uh, bronchus. Okay, so the epithelial cells are columnar epithelial cells, which means that they are very, very tall epithelial cells. Okay, so they resemble columns, they're column-like. Okay, now, interdispersed amongst these columnar epithelial cells, you will have a different cell type known as a goblet cell. Now, these goblet cells secrete mucus onto the surface of the epithelial cells, and uh, this mucus will be involved in the mucociliary escalator, okay, which we'll talk about in a moment. So, let me show some of these goblet cells in green. So, interdispersed just randomly amongst uh, the columnar epithelial cells, you'll have these goblet cells, which I'm now showing in green here. So, uh, should I try and label these up? Yes, I will. So, this is a goblet cell, which is a special mucus secreting type of cell, okay, and these tall epithelial cells are columnar epithelial cells. Okay, right, now these columnar epithelial cells are going to be ciliated. They have little finger-like uh, projections from the apical surface which project into uh, the lumen of the airway. Okay, so let me draw some of these cilia on their surface. And what's going to happen is the mucus that the uh, goblet cells secrete is going to end up on the surface of these cilia. Okay, and um, these cilia are going to gradually waft and they'll move, they'll waft the mucus up the airways and they'll waft it up to the higher airways. So you'll go from small bronchioles to bigger bronchi to bigger bronchi still up into the main to uh, primary bronchi, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, then up the trachea, uh, up through the larynx, out of the uh, respiratory tract all together into the laryngopharynx, then down the esophagus and into the stomach. Okay, so this is what's known as the mucociliary escalator, and it involves uh, the cilia moving this mucus that the goblet cells and also other glands, which we'll see in a moment, um, secrete up and out of the respiratory tract, okay? So it's involved in keeping the respiratory tract free of dirt, and also it's involved in prote protecting the respiratory tract from pathogens, because if you inhale pathogens, what will happen is they will go down into the respiratory tract, okay, and they will get stuck in the mucus on the surface of these airways, and then they'll gradually be uh, moved uh, by the mucociliary escalator out of the uh, respiratory tract, uh, and into the stomach, where they will hopefully burn. Okay, so mucociliary escalator, this is. Okay, so it's involved in cleaning the airways. Right, uh, now, these epithelial cells, what are they sitting on? Well, 
they are sitting on a basement membrane of collagen. So let's show this now. So in turquoise, this is the basement membrane of collagen. Now this is a very rigid structure made out of proteins. Now as I say, the main protein that the basement membrane is made out of is collagen, but there are a few others that are in there. So fibrillin is another very important component of the basement membrane. Um, Laminins are also a very important component of the basement membrane. And basically, these columnar epithelial cells are going to attach onto the basement membrane. So the columnar epithelial cells will have integrins in their basolateral membranes, which will attach to the laminins within the basement membrane, and that will hold the epithelial cells onto the basement membrane. Okay, now, what's underneath the basement membrane? Well, underneath the basement membrane, what you have is another thick layer of connective tissue. Okay, so here it comes. Uh, this is what is known as the lamina propria. Okay, and it's made up mainly of collagen, but there are other connective tissues in there as well. Okay, such as heparin, sulfate, proteoglycans. So, it's a layer of connective tissue, and it has an important... Um, important structures within it. So it will have blood vessels running within it. So let's put some of these in. Okay, so let's put a few blood vessels in here. Okay, it will also have a very important cell type known as a mast cell. And really the lamina propria is going to be the star of asthma. It's where asthma is all going to occur basically. Okay, so you have these little cells in here called mast cells, which we will come back to later. So this is meant to represent a mast cell. Okay, so this layer then is known as lamina propria. Okay, now, uh, there is another piece of terminology that people commonly use, which is the terminology mucosa. Okay, now mucosa re um, refers to the epithelial cell layer along with the basement membrane, along with the lamina propria. So all of what we've discussed now is known as the mucosa, okay? So when people discuss mucosa, they mean the combination of all three of these layers that we've seen so far. The columnar epithelial cells, the basement membrane, and then the lamina propria underneath. Okay, now, uh, let's talk about what is underneath the lamina propria then. So, underneath the lamina propria, what you then have is a, a layer of smooth muscle cells, okay? So, this is the bronchial smooth muscle cell layer. So, I'll denote this in vivid purple, which I hope is going to uh, be distinguishable for you um, from the um, red for the lamina propria. Okay, right. So, this is a smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, so these are smooth muscle cells bronchial smooth muscle cells. Okay, and let me discuss how these uh, smooth muscle cells are going to be arranged, because they're going to be arranged in um, rings, basically. So this is the bronchial smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, so what it's going to consist of is loads of smooth muscle cells that are arranged in rings. So let's say this is a smooth muscle cell. Then we have another smooth muscle cell here. Another one here, another one here, okay, and you can see that I'm joining them tip to tip, end to end, basically, okay, and this is what uh, happens in this smooth muscle cell layer. Now, the importance of this is that they form these complete rings of smooth muscle cells around uh, the bronchus, okay? Now, what's going to happen when these smooth muscle cells contract? Okay, well, when they contract, their length is going to decrease. So the length of all these smooth muscle cells will go down. Okay, um, now if all of their lengths go down, then you can understand that the circumference of the entire ring of bronchial smooth muscle cells is also going to decrease. So basically, it's going to do this. You go from having a large circumference to having a much smaller circumference. Now, when you have a much smaller circumference, that means that the diameter goes down, because diameter is equal to the circumference divided by pi. So, if the circumference goes down, back to my finger example, 
what's going to also happen, the diameter of the ring is going to go down, okay? So you're going to get constriction of the ring, basically. So contraction of the smooth muscle cells leads to uh, constriction of the uh, rings of the uh, smooth muscle cells. Now, when these rings of smooth muscle cells that surround uh, the bronchus constrict, then that constriction is going to be conveyed uh, to the layers within, basically. So, the entire uh, wall of the bronchus is going to constrict down, basically. And that means that this lumen here, the lumen of the airway, where the air is moving through, is also going to constrict, okay? So you're going to get bronchoconstriction, is the fancy word uh, for constriction of a bronchus. So bronco, and I hope it's all going to fit in, but I don't think it is. Bronchoconstriction, yeah, I'll call it there, constriction. There we go. Okay, right. Um, so, when the smooth muscle cells are induced to constrict, it's going to cause constriction of the airways, which is going to reduce the movement of air through that uh, airway. Okay, now that's not the final layer of uh, the bronchus. You have another layer outside of the smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, so next layer. And this next layer is called the submucosa. Okay, so we have the mucosa, which was um, the name for the epithelium along with the basement membrane, along with the lamina propria. And then underneath this layer of smooth muscle cells, we then have the submucosa. Okay, so um, the smooth muscle cell layer separates the mucosa from the submucosa. Okay, so... What does the submucosa have within it? Well, again, it's got a lot of connective tissue within it. And importantly, it's got what are known as submucosal glands. Okay, so these are large tubes that run through the submucosa. Okay, and they are lined by epithelial cells. So let me show one of these here. Okay, so they'll have a lumen here, and then they're lined by epithelial cells, which are secreting mucus into the lumen of the tube here. Okay, so this is a submucosal gland here. Okay, so these epithelial cells are secreting uh, mucus into the lumen of the submucosal gland. Now, what does the submucosal gland do? Well, eventually it's going to uh, come out of the submucosal layer. It'll run longitudinally in the submucosal layer, but eventually it will come out of the submucosal layer. It'll burst through the smooth muscle cell layer, burst through the lamina propria, and then it will just empty onto the surface. Okay, uh, so these submucosal glands, they release the mucus onto uh, the surface of the uh, epithelium, basically. Okay, so they also help in the production of mucus. Okay, so I will then highlight the rest of the submucosa up in blue here. Okay, so this is the submucosa. Now, finally, outside of the submucosa, you then do have one final layer, which is uh, the cartilaginous layer. Okay, so you do then have cartilage surrounding the submucosa. Okay, so let me put these here. Now, you do not have a continuous ring of cartilage that surrounds the entire bronchus. Instead, what you have is a bunch of interconnected plates, okay? So, here is a piece of cartilage here, okay? And here is another piece of cartilage here. Okay, right, so you have gaps between neighbouring... Uh, cartilage plates, basically. So, let me colour in these cartilage plates in green here. Okay, so the type of cartilage that these uh, cartilage plates here are connected, or are made up of, is hyaline cartilage. Okay, and I think to really communicate uh, how the cartilage surrounds the submucosa, you need to look at a, this picture from a different angle, basically. So instead of looking at the bronchus in cross-section like this, let's look at it as though we're looking at it from the side. Okay, so here is our bronchus now, let's say. Okay, and we're now looking at it from the side. So let me now show you the cartilage that covers it. So you might have a structure that looks like this. Okay, so let me colour the cartilage in green again. So this is the cartilage here, and where there isn't cartilage, that's where 
uh, the submucosa is the outermost layer of the uh, bronchus, basically. Okay, so like that. So you can see that if we were to uh, take a cross section, let's say, take a cross section here, we'd have places where there was a cartilage um, layer surrounding uh, the submucosa, okay, so analogous to here and then places where there uh, was no cartilage covering the submucosal layer, analogous to here. Okay, so this is how it works. This is why it's known as interconnected discs or interconnected plates of cartilage. So interconnected network of cartilage. Okay, um, and the type of cartilage that surrounds the submucosa, as I said, is hyaline cartilage. So I'll write that down as well. Hyaline cartilage. Right, okay, so that concludes our discussion of the structure of a bronchus, okay? So now what we'll do is begin to discuss the pathology of asthma then. Okay, right, so we're going to do a uh, simplified pathology of asthma. We're not going to go through it in full details. If you're interested in the full details, I have a whole video in which we discuss the pathology of asthma. Okay, right, so asthma then. So, asthma is a chronic condition where uh, you suffer from asthmatic attacks, okay? So, occasionally, or it can be very regularly, I mean, some, there are different severities of asthma. Some people will have asthma attacks very, very regularly, so they'll be very persistent, whereas some people will have it once, you know, once in a full moon, okay? So there are different severities. So some people's is intermittent, some people's is very persistent. In addition, the severity of the asthma attack itself can vary. Some people uh, will get... Uh, obstruction of the airways that is mild and doesn't really impair their breathing that much. It makes them wheeze a little bit, but it isn't life-threatening, um, i.e. they can still breathe, okay? Whereas some people will suffer from asthmatic attacks where um, they their uh, breathing is so obstructed that they are actually at risk of asphyxiation and dying. And asthma is a very serious condition when it gets to the point where uh, asthmatic attacks can actually uh, completely stop you breathing and lead to death via asphyxiation. Okay, so, uh, an asthmatic attack then, uh, we, which is something I probably should have said before that speech, is when um, you get this inflammatory response occurring within the uh, bronchi, which causes major obstruction of the airways and can lead to um, complete cessation of breathing, basically, and respiratory failure. Okay, so, um, not everyone suffers from it. Some people who suffer from asthma are called asthmatics, and uh, there are two main types of asthma, okay? So, these two distinguishing types are separated because of what triggers the asthmatic attack, okay? So, there is allergic asthma, which is where uh, the asthma uh, asthmatic attack is triggered by exposure to something which you are allergic to. So allergic asthma. So if you inhale something uh, which you are allergic to, the common examples are pollen, uh, proteins associated with dogs and cats, proteins associated with the house dust mite, things like that, uh, then those will trigger an asthmatic attack. Okay. Uh, in contrast, there is then non-allergic asthma, where uh, the asthma can be triggered by uh, other things, such as uh, cold air can trigger non-allergic asthma, okay? Also, environmental pollution, uh, such as sulfur uh, dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, so let me give some of these examples. So, cold air, breathing in cold air can trigger non-allergic asthmatic attacks. Uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, environmental pollutants. And you might say, well, what's the difference between um, inhaling sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide compared to inhaling some protein from a dog? Okay, well, the important thing in allergic asthma is that what you are... Um, what the asthmatic attack is being driven by is a protein in allergic asthma, whereas these are not proteins. 
okay? In addition, things like exercise can trigger non-allergic asthma. The um, toxins in cigarette smoke can trigger non-allergic asthma. Um, in addition, stress and anxiety can also trigger non-allergic asthma. Now, non-allergic asthma is much less well understood than allergic asthma. Allergic asthma we have a pretty good understanding of. And we understand also how allergic asthma can lead to non-allergic asthma. Because every time you have an allergic asthmatic attack, uh, gradually your bronchi bronchi, your airways get more and more damaged. And this can lead to the exposure of neurons, which then are on the surface of the airways, so are exposed to the air. And then... Um, if you breathe in cold air or environmental pollution or horrible chemicals in cigarette smoke, um, these can all activate these neurons, and these neurons can then activate the asthmatic attack. Okay, so we're going to focus on allergic asthma because allergic asthma is better understood. For instance, we don't understand at all really how stress and anxiety can lead to uh, a um, non-allergic asthmatic attack. Okay, it some of something on the level of the um, uh, set, central nervous system is therefore triggering that off, and that uh, is a bit of a mystery. Okay, but it is known that stress and anxiety can cause asthmatic attacks in non-allergic asthma. Okay, but we all focus on an allergic asthma. Okay, right. So uh, let's have a look at the pathology of allergic asthma then. So it begins years and years and years ago when you were first exposed to this allergen okay so it begins with primary exposure to the allergen so this will have happened long long ago when you were a toddler maybe you breathed in the um, thing that you were destined to be allergic to for the first time okay so let's say you're allergic to pollen okay so you've got a good whiff of pollen for the first time now, you have not initiated an adaptive immune response to this yet because this is your first exposure to the allergen, so you can't have initiated an adaptive immune response to it yet. However, what happens in people who are allergic to whichever allergen this is, is it's going to trigger an adaptive immune response. Specifically, it's going to trigger a humoral adaptive immune response. Okay, now this is what goes wrong basically in asthmat uh, in allergic asthma. You should not initiate a humoral adaptive immune response against this allergen because the whole definition of an allergen is that it's a protein that you are going to initiate an immune response against, but you shouldn't. Okay, so this protein is harmless, it doesn't deserve an immune response. Okay, for instance, pollen. Pollen does not deserve an adaptive immune response, it's not harmful. Okay, and most people would not initiate an adaptive immune response against pollen. Ideally, you would not initiate an adaptive immune response against pollen. So if you're allergic to pollen, then it's because you're initiating an adaptive immune response against this innocuous protein. Okay, so you get a humoral adaptive immune response, and specifically this humoral adaptive immune response results in the production of immunoglobulin E antibodies. Okay, so let me draw a little picture of an immunoglobulin E antibody. Okay, so there are five different types of antibody, okay? They are called, let me list them out, IgA is the first one, then IgD, I'll do them in alphabetic order, IgE, and then IgG, and finally IgM. So these are the uh, five different types of antibody that you can produce, okay? So, we are specifically going to produce antibody uh, of the IgE form. Now, basically there are two main portions of an antibody. You can divide antibodies up into two main portions. Okay, This portion down here, which I will now highlight in pink, is the fixed region of an antibody. So this is not the portion that binds to the antigen. Okay, so this is what's known as the FC region, which stands for fragment crystallizable. Okay, and it's because it's fixed amongst antibodies. However, these five different types of antibodies will have different fragment crystallizables. Okay, they'll have different FC regions. So, 
whether you are IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG or IgM, it determines what this FC region is like, okay? Now, there is this other region up here, or these two regions, which are the portion which binds to the antigen. In this case, it's an allergen, but allergens are antigens. An antigen just means any protein that you are capable of producing an antibody against. Okay, so allergens are all antigens. It's just that antigens aren't all allergens. I mean, there are some antigens which really do deserve an immune response being initiated against them. This is not one of them. Okay, so this is what's known as the FAB, which stands for fragment antigen binding, the antigen binding fragment. Okay, so... Um, all antibodies have a fragment uh, which will bind the antigen, okay, so an antigen binding fragment, and they also have an FC region. Now, the um, antigen binding region will uh, differ for absolutely every single antibody you meet, basically. Um, so, well, it, you'll produce a lot of antibody that will be the same, but if you go to two different plasma cells that are launched against different antigens, they'll be producing very different antibodies. Even if they're both producing IgE antibodies, the antibodies will differ in their antigen binding fragment here. Okay, so which antibody type you make? which one of these five you choose to make determines which FC region you use. But the f antigen binding fragment that you use is specific to the plasma cell that we are looking at. So if we go to a plasma cell, depending on which allergen or antigen this plasma cell was launched against, it will have its own specific uh, antigen binding fragment over here. So we are going to produce IgE antibodies, which means that this FC region down here is the specific FC region for the IgE antibody type, okay? And these IgEs are specifically targeted against this allergen, which means that this FAB region here specifically binds to that allergen and not other antigens. Okay, so this is what's known as a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, so when you produce um, antibody, specifically IgE antibody, against uh, an allergen, against some antigen which doesn't deserve to have this humoral adaptive immune response initiated against it, that's known as a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. It's called a hypersensitivity reaction because effectively the immune system is being too sensitive it's launching uh, an adaptive immune system response against uh, something that really is innocent, that doesn't deserve this huge fuss being made over it. Okay, so, regardless, when you were first exposed, you produced all of this IgE, which is targeted against the allergen. Okay, now what happens? Well, this IgE is going to end up being mounted on the surface of mast cells. So we come back to this cell type that I told you earlier was within the lamina propria. Okay, so we'll now draw a bigger picture of this mast cell. Okay, so here is our mast cell. Now these are sentinel cells. They are a cell whose, which is scattered around all tissues of your body. And their job is to be on the lookout always uh, for invading pathogens. And if they find an invading pathogen, they will set off alarm signals which will trigger an inflammatory response. Okay, so they have on their surface a receptor, okay, which is known as the FC Epsilon R1. Okay, so this stands for the fragment crystallizable, FC, and then the epsilon refers to the FC region of an IgE antibody. So epsilon is the equivalent letter in the Greek alphabet for E. So this means the uh, FC region of an IgE antibody, and then it's the receptor 1. So this is a protein that is on the surface of mast cells, uh, which combines to the FC region of IgE antibodies. Okay, so here is our FC epsilon R1, okay, on the surface of a mast cell, and it's going to bind to the FC region 
of our IgE antibody here that is targeted against this allergen. Okay, now, basically, this is arming these mast cells to recognize the allergen, okay? Because once the allergen comes and binds to this uh, IgE that's targeted against it, okay, uh, then it will trigger activation of the FC epsilon R1, which will trigger activation of the mast cell. Okay, so you've now basically armed these mast cells to recognize the allergen. Okay, but this why is this happening? Well, the body thinks this allergen was actually dangerous. So now what it's doing is it's arming all its mast cells, uh, basically, and telling them, if you ever see this allergen again, set off the alarm signal. Okay, so this is what is what happens when you have a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, when you produce all of this IgE against an allergen. Basically, it mounts itself on the mast cells all over your body, but in particular, we're looking at uh, the fact that it's mounting them on the lamina propria, um, well, the mast cells within the lamina propria, um, and basically it's arming them and saying, if you ever see this again, set off alarm signal, set off the inflammatory response. Okay. So, now what's going to happen is we're all set for our secondary um, exposure to the antigen, okay, or the allergen in this case. And we'll talk, continue this discussion and see what happens when you get the secondary exposure, which we've now got these mast cells ready to uh, react to uh, in the next video.